The fire raged for more than eight hours. 348 firefighters and 41 apparatus from 22 cities and towns as far away as Boston worked in zero degree temperatures to halt the conflagration. Damages were conservatively estimated to be $35 million. 36 buildings were leveled, destroying 261 individual businesses in six square blocks in the heart of the city, including three hotels, seven banks, two theaters, one newspaper building, and several large business blocks. 1,000 people were instantly unemployed. And while 250 people were hospitalized, 20 for overnight observation, and some firefighters suffered frostbite and broken bones, there was, miraculously, no loss of life. Fall River's Great Fire of 1928 was an accident waiting to happen. Like the aging business districts of so many New England cities, the burned area of downtown Fall River was crowded with old buildings of inferior construction, built before the age of more modern fire preventative practices, like fire division walls and automatic sprinkler systems. Streets that were 50 to 75 feet in width were no defense against the reach of the flames fanned by a strong wind. It could easily have been predicted that once a blaze got started here, it would sweep unchecked with the greatest potential of becoming a full-fledged conflagration. In fact, the properly protected buildings equipped with wired glass, tin-clad shutters, open sprinklers, automatic sprinklers adjacent to the windows and firewalls were instrumental in halting the spread of the inferno in several directions. About 6.15 p.m. on the evening of Thursday, February 2, 1928, George Sullivan, circulation manager, and William Cooper, his assistant, were just leaving work at the Fall River Herald building. A cold westerly wind was roaring up Pocasset Street as the men braced themselves against the icy zephyr. They happened to glance across the street, and both men noticed a flickering light in the windowless Pocasset Mill Number 2 just one of five voluminous structures between Picasset and Central Streets that were currently in the process of being dismantled. They knew no one was supposed to be there working at this late hour. The light grew more radiant, signaling the escalation of flames. They quickly reported what they saw to patrolman James Galvin, who was walking his beat in the area. Galvin sounded the alarm at 6.27 p.m. from Box 1253, located on the corner of Pocasset and South Main Streets. The Central Fire Engine House was located behind City Hall, only about 800 feet away. But even in the short amount of time it took the firefighters to respond, the smoke had become so thick that they could not locate the origin of the blaze. The fire grew more rapidly still, reaching a belt tower that connected with all the floors of the mill granting the flames unrestricted access to the entire building and beyond the control of one fire company. The second alarm was sounded at 6.34 p.m. and Fire Chief Jeremiah F. Sullivan went to the nearby newspaper office and called back to the fire headquarters to signal a general alarm, bringing out all the available apparatus in the city and requesting calls to be made for assistance from nearby cities and towns. By 7 o'clock, Three of the Cassett Mill structures were burning furiously. This was just the beginning of a very long night, and it would be another four days before the last of the fire apparatus would be removed. In response to Chief Sullivan's appeal for assistance, outside apparatus began to arrive at the fire as early as 7.45 p.m. They continued to join Fall River's forces until after midnight adding 32 pumpers ranging in capacity from 500 to 1,300 gallons per minute, as well as other equipment. Boston, 50 miles to the north, sent three engines and three hose wagons. Providence, Rhode Island contributed four pumper engines. Brockton, Newport, and Swansea sent two apparatus each, and the Naval Training Station and other communities sent one each. The smaller towns that could not send apparatus sent large volunteer crews, composed of 10 to 30 men. The newspapers dubbed these volunteers the Hayseed Brigade. Four years previously, Fall River and nearby cities had converted their equipment to conform with the national standard hose coupling thread, and thus, with the exception of Newport, Rhode Island, which brought and used adapter couplings, the outside communities were able to connect directly with Fall River's hydrants and hose. 
This interchangeability of hose was a vital factor in the firefighting operations, as so much of the hose that was first laid immediately froze to the ice in the streets and had to be abandoned when the crews were forced to move to other locations to battle the blaze. U.S. Weather Bureau records show that during the early hours of the fire, the temperature was 15 degrees and the wind was from the northwest and southwest. About midnight, the wind changed to north and northeast. The maximum wind speed was 24 miles per hour and the temperature had dropped steadily to zero by six o'clock the next morning. This fast and changing wind would prove to be the fire's best friend. In several cases, the wind forced the flames to double back creating additional destruction and confounding firefighters' efforts to get a handle on the spread of the blaze. The late Mrs. Florence Cook Brigham, curator of the Fall River Historical Society from 1976 to 1990, was an eyewitness to the fire when she was 28 years old. Her husband, Richard Curtis Brigham, was the local weather observer for the United States Weather Bureau and had called her from the Mohegan Hotel, on whose roof stood the weather tower to tell her that the fire had started at the Bacasset Mills. He told me that one of the firemen said it was going to be a humdinger, she later remarked to reporters. I was scared to death. I thought the whole city was doomed. It was terrible, really terrible. The only thing that kept us warm was the fire, but we had to keep moving back as it spread. Coincidentally, the society she would lead in later years had its offices and exhibit room in room 45 on the fourth floor of the Buffington Building at 10 Purchase Street. The society's entire collection was destroyed in the fire, except a selection of important items that had been stored in a Herring Hall in Marvin's safe. The exact sequence of the spread of the fire could not be determined precisely, with Pocasset Mill No. 1 facing east, Mill No. 2 facing south, and Mill No. 3 facing north. The fire fanned out in several directions about the same time. Wind carried burning embers to wooden roofs and collapsing structures spread the flames, which made controlling the inferno impossible. Just as crews would set up in an area, the fire would take off in another direction. While primary attention was directed towards checking the spread of the fire to the north and the east, where there was a congestion of businesses, the fires swelled south across Central and Bedford Streets to ignite the granite block and the three big banks across from it next to City Hall. Some eyewitnesses reported that the fire crossed the street from the Durfee block to the granite block, north to south, and then moved from the granite block to the banking establishments west to east by heat radiated by the wind. However, in view of the frequent changes in its direction, it is entirely possible that heat and flame were carried by the wind across Bedford Street from the Buffington Building to the banks. When the six-story granite wall of the south side of Pocasset Mill No. 2 collapsed at 7.40 p.m. and the flames roared across Pocasset Street and directly onto the buildings on the opposite side, three firemen were hurt, suffering injuries ranging from shock to fractured limbs. First to go was the Nathan Miller Building, followed by the old Herald Building, both made of brick. Fire lapped at the new Herald News Building next door, and the exposure to the heat from the flames was so severe that the plate glass windows cracked and shattered to the street. Because of its newer construction, however, the building was equipped with a complete automatic sprinkler system with 32 sprinkler heads near the windows, preventing the fire from gaining entrance. The exterior cornice burned and fell, and the building was singed. However, the interior suffered only water damage. The Mohegan Hotel, part of the five-story Durfee block, caught fire from the spread of the flames from Pocasset Mill No. 3 on Central Street. Built in 1914, the Mohegan was the largest hotel in the city, able to accommodate up to 500 guests. Unfortunately, the building contained only a partial system of automatic sprinklers located on the street and basement levels. At about 7.45, firebrands ignited the roof and the fire quickly spread throughout the entire building. Manager William Durfee had evacuated the guests as soon as the first fire company had arrived on the scene at the mill, and everyone was safely sent to the Hotel Mellon. Much personal property was lost in the exodus, including $8,000 in jewelry belonging to Mrs. Durfee, the wife of the hotel's proprietor. In less than an hour, the entire Durfee block was burning fiercely, including the Rialto Theater next door. 
firemen directed their streams onto the roof of the building on the other side of the theater to hinder the blaze from spreading any farther north. While the firefighters were performing their duties, there were other activities associated with a fire of this magnitude being performed. Gas company employees moved from meter to meter in advance of the fire to turn off the gas and protect structures from explosions, risking their lives in the process. From the very beginning of the blaze, the streets were filled with men rushing to save their business records from the threatened buildings. The Metacomet Bank, for instance, had removed its entire contents prior to 11 p.m. There was a bizarre story reported about the proprietor of Madame Tussauds' Museum of Celebrities in Wax, a traveling show in Fall River for a brief engagement at the Granite Block. The manager had angered a group of firemen early in the evening because he stubbornly remained at his ticket booth in case patrons wanted to view the wax figures. He was finally ordered to leave, and the firemen, none too gently, removed the wax figures to the street, where they were dropped onto the ground without thought. Several bystanders believed that these were the bodies of victims of the fire, and it even called for an ambulance, which led to the rumor that there were been mass casualties downtown. The wax figures were then carried to the Metacomet Bank and lined up facing away from the street as the manager went in search of a safer place to store them. A police officer, mistaking the dummies in the smoke and darkness for people, ordered them to move along there, move along, you can't stand here. It was not recorded what the officer said when he discovered his mistake. At this point, the wind shifted from the northwest to the southwest, pushing the flames across North Main Street to the brick three-and-a-half-story Atwater building on the corner of North Main and Bedford. The relentless fire swept from one building to the next. The businesses bounded by Granite and Bedford Streets were no match for the flames, and they quickly succumbed. The five-story brick-and-steel Buffington building was in the same block as the Atwater on the northwest corner of Bedford and Purchase Streets, said Mrs. Brigham. Everybody kept saying that the fire would stop when it reached the Buffington building because that building is fireproof. The structure, unlike its neighbors, had wired glass windows and metal sashes, and these windows held. However, plate glass windows on the Purchase Street side were no defense against the severe exposure by radiated heat from buildings burning across the street. These cracked from the heat, and the fire ignited the contents on all upper floors. One office on the street level, the Aetna Life Insurance Company, was the only exception. Some of its windows were cracked, but not a single piece of furniture was damaged. Even though, on both sides, the offices had been burned out and destroyed. Remarkably, the Buffington building structure was not severely damaged and was considered a good candidate for reconditioning. To the north of the Buffington building in the next block was a gas station on the corner of Granite and Purchase Streets. Around this business was a sizable amount of open space and it was thought that the easterly spread of the fire might be checked at this location. However, the same change in the direction of the wind that had checked the fire in its northerly spread at Bank Street worked against the fire being stopped here. Amazingly, it was later determined that no gasoline, fuel oil, or city gas had contributed in any way to the brutality of this fire. The gas tanks here were underground, and the small amount of gas in the pumps was quietly burned off without incident. At about 8.30 p.m., the flames from the burning Atwater building on Bedford and Main Streets spread to the four-story brick New Wilbur Hotel, located at the corner of Granite and North Main Streets. Renovated in only the last year, the structure could not survive against the intensity of the inferno fueled by the high winds. The next building north contained the offices of the Fall River Daily Globe. According to coverage that paper published the next day, employees of the Wilbur and the Globe halted the progress of the fire for a while at the hotel, but the deadly combination of wind and fire won out when the roof ignited and the flames swiftly traveled from floor to floor until the entire hotel was consumed. The northerly spread of the flames next attacked the Temple Bethel Synagogue that faced Bank Street and extended back into the center of the new Wilbur Hotel block. Principally of wooden construction, the synagogue was totally destroyed, but not before Rabbi Morton Goldberg had rushed into the burning temple to save the Holy Scrolls, the canopy, and some valuable religious texts. Unfortunately, the rabbi lost his priceless personal library that he'd been collecting for 15 years. To the east of the temple sat the two-story brick New England Telephone Company. 
Wooden tin clad shutters and wire glass windows reinforced by outside sprinklers prevented the entrance of the fire to this building. But the smoke was so thick that it was necessary for the operators to abandon their stations for a period of six hours, the structure being evacuated about 11 p.m. Two fire crews from Brockton saved the telephone exchange building, but all the phone lines were out of order from the water that was poured into it. With the failure of telephone service, all communication between Fall River and the outside world was essentially cut off. Both the Postal and Western Union Telegraph offices had been destroyed early in the fire. In dramatic fashion, the fire was finally checked in its northerly spread along North Main Street by the firewall and open sprinklers protecting the south side of the Globe Building and the few windows that opened into a courtyard on its east. These open sprinklers operated so successfully that the ordinary thin glass in these windows was not even cracked. And while the fire did not advance any further north, other, even more massive catastrophes awaited. Witnesses reported that the east side of Main Street was an inferno, as building after building caught fire, defying all human attempts to control the flames furiously burning within them. As the night wore on, the wind increased in velocity, and it seemed there would be no end to it. By 9 p.m., the blaze had spread to cover Fall River's entire central downtown business district. Pumper trucks were strategically placed along the street as more out-of-town help arrived throughout the night. Try as they might, the fire companies could not contain the area of conflagration. The blaze on the east side of Main Street spread from the Waring Building to the Premier Theater on the corner of Granite and Rock, a two-story wooden structure that was little more than fuel to this fire. The Metacomet National Bank at the corner of Bedford and Rock Streets and the string of buildings bordering Bedford Street as far as the police station were also ignited from flying sparks. The bank had recently undergone an extensive and expensive renovation. However, the work was cosmetic only. No firewall had been added to the structure between the bank and the other buildings to the west, so it was relatively easy for the fire to enter through unprotected openings and practically destroy this structure. The continued spread of the fire was finally checked in this direction by considerable efforts on the part of firefighters. The Great Fire of 1928 was just getting started. The interstate bus terminal located behind the granite block was destroyed when the front-facing wall of Mill No. 1 fell directly on it. The northern end of the landmark 84-year-old granite block was observed to be on fire about 9 p.m. In this four-story granite structure, 16 businesses were located on the street level, and 65 others were on the upper floors. The granite block had two firewalls across the building, but neither one reached the roof, so instead of stopping the fire, they merely slowed it down. The fire spread through the structure from north to south, and it was four hours later, close to 1 a.m., before the devastation was complete. Sadly, it was reported that in weeks before the fire, plans had been underway for an installation of a complete system of automatic sprinkler protection in the granite block. If this improvement had been completed prior to the fire, it's believed that in all probability this building would not have been destroyed. While the granite block was burned, Engine 26 from Boston protected City Hall and the post office, both fire-resistant granite structures, though without the window protection, such as wire glass, metal sashes, tin fire shutters or open sprinkler systems that had saved other buildings that night. The firemen effectively prevented the fire from entering the windows of these buildings by covering them with a water curtain from hose streams. In 1928, the automobile had become a popular mode of transportation, so much so that when the news spread of the fire in Fall River, hundreds of thousands of people made their way to the city to watch the event firsthand. All roads leading into the city were jammed with vehicles of all types, inching their way to the bright, glowing sky in front of them. Every so often, a fire apparatus and its crew would approach and the long line would part to allow them passage. It was reported that an astounding 250,000 sightseers made their way to Fall River that night and in the days that followed, prompting Chief of Police Martin Feeney to call for militia to aid in patrolling the fire zone, in which martial law had been declared. The first call for militia was sounded at 12.10 a.m., and the second call at 1.25 a.m. A funny story was reported in the Boston Globe with the headline, 
guardsmen at Fall River obey rules too literally that deserves retelling. The best story of the whole fire, however, concerns Judge Frank M. Sylvia, Justice of the Second District Court, and Fall River's Mayor, Harry Monks. Judge Sylvia, attempting to go to his chambers in the courthouse on Rock Street, was ordered back by one of the National Guardsmen. Explanations made by the judge did no good. The youth was adamant. He had his orders, and he was going to obey them. The judge turned away and went looking for Mayor Monks. He explained his predicament to the chief executive, who said, Oh, that's all right. I'll get you by. Incidentally, I think I'll drop into the courthouse with you for a while. I've got some things I want to talk about. The two walked back to Rock Street, where the young man came smartly to arms. You can't get by here, he said. Now listen, he said. You've to use reason in all things. This is Judge Sylvie, and he wants to get into the courthouse. Surely he ought to get by. The young guardsman thought about it for a few minutes, then decided to relent. All right, he said, that sounds reasonable. Go ahead, Judge. Judge Sylvia started past the deadline, and Mayor Monks fell in step. Just a minute, cried the youthful soldier to the mayor. Where do you think you're going? I'm going to the courthouse with the judge, said his honor. Oh, no, you're not, said the youth. Young man, said Mayor Monks sternly. Do you know who I am? I am the mayor of this city. I know that, all right, bud and the young man pointed to the southeast. City Hall's over there. The block next to City Hall on the north and bounded by Bedford, 2nd, Main, and Market Streets was occupied by three of Fall River's largest banks. Citizen Savings on the northwest corner, the Union Savings on the southwest corner, and the Massasoit Picasset on the east. It's unclear exactly when the Citizen Savings caught fire, but around 2 a.m. the Massasoit Picasset abruptly burst into flames. Even though the Union Savings Bank was reported to be a fire-resistant construction, it had a plank and timber roof supported on a steel frame. Firefighters believed that the building was saved by the several inches of water that had sprayed onto the roof from their hose strings. But according to witnesses, the fire snuck in through a plain glass skylight and this building was doomed to go the way of the neighboring banks. Fall River had enacted an ordinance in 1915 before the Steiger Store fire, requiring that all new construction use fire-retarded roofing materials. But even 13 years later in 1928, many of the old wooden shingle roofs remained. And because of that fact, some 25 smaller fires were started by burning embers that landed on roofs like these as far away as three quarters of a mile from the center of the main fire. Chief Jeremiah Sullivan declared the Great Fire of 1928 under control at 2.30 a.m. Throughout the fire area, practically all the contents contained in wooden and steel filing cases were destroyed. Those business owners who had not risked life and limb to salvage their account books and legal documents learned in the morning that the fire had taken their files, records, and fiscal accounts, an untold and irreplaceable collection of important papers. The offices of the Income Tax Bureau had been in the Buffington Building, and 4,000 state income tax returns filed since the first of the year in Bristol, Barnstable, Dukes, Nantucket, and Plymouth counties were now just so much ash. The loss of files and paperwork proved to be a stroke of good luck for a Brooklyn woman, Mrs. Catherine Barletto, 26, formerly of Fall River. She was to be the first woman in New York to be sentenced to a life in prison under a new crime laws for her fourth robbery conviction, the first three of which occurred in Fall River. Because her records were burned in the fire, her first three convictions could not be proved, and it was estimated that the most she could serve would be five years. In addition to the more open method of storing documents, it was conservatively estimated that there were 125 safe of all types involved in this conflagration. These businesses fared better, as most of the safes with a high fire resistant rating worked properly and preserved their contents. Mrs. Brigham said her father, Judge Benjamin Cook Jr., was optimistic that his legal papers stored in his office would survive the inferno because they were in a fireproof safe. What he hadn't figured on was that the safe would fall into the Quickishan River and that its door would be knocked off by a granite ledge. All the contents were lost. Of the seven banks burned in the fire, four contained the typical bank vault, massive walls and heavy steel doors, which preserved their contents perfectly even exhibiting no sign of water damage. The exception to this statistic was the basement storage vault, 
of the Union Savings Bank. This particular vault was completely submerged for several hours and became filled with water. Water rose in the book vault above it to a depth of six inches, and the contents absorbed water to a height of two feet above the floor. When the sun rose on the morning of the 3rd of February, the 150-foot chimney of the Pocasset Mill offered a strange sight, standing solitary amidst the ruins of the mill. To the amazement of onlookers, smoke was seen pouring from the chimney for the first time in two years, as the updraft sucked the fumes from the smoldering ruins and released them into the air. With the exception of part of the South End, which was demolished several days later, all of the walls of the granite block collapsed during the fire. Likewise, the remaining walls of the Pocasset Mills either dropped during the fire or were taken down during the city's massive cleanup efforts. Dynamite teams arrived in the city the next day, and after much study and engineering, the five-story, 210-foot-long north wall of the Pocasset Mill No. 3 was brought down 10 days later. This wall was the most dangerous of the remaining structures because it was standing unsupported by frame or timber, except for its own weight. When it fell, stones flew in all directions from the explosion and subsequent collapse. On North Main Street, the Globe Building, whose firewall just 10 days before had stopped the northern progression of the conflagration, was hit by a cantaloupe-sized chunk of granite, smashing a window in the proofing room on the fifth floor. Some of the flying stones also reached the Masonic Temple on North Main Street, three blocks away. Several innocent bystanders were injured, but none seriously. And within an amazingly short 18 months, all of this destruction and ruin had been rebuilt. Contractors announced that more than 350 men would be hired as soon as the foundations of the proposed structures were begun, and the day and night shifts on schedule to be completed by October 1st, 1929. Ground was broken on May 28th for a new Tempel Bethel on High and Locust Streets. The front of the Herald News Building was rebuilt, the Buffington Building was rehabilitated, and the devastated area was modernized with wider streets that could accommodate automobile traffic and pedestrian use, could serve as reasonable fire stops during any future conflagrations and would meet the demands of new firefighting apparatus. But perhaps the biggest symbol of progress following the fire was the construction of a new granite block at the cost of $750,000. Just like the rebuilding frenzy that had occurred following the Great Fire of 1843, Fall River was determined to show its residents, business owners, and the outside world that it could be depended upon to rise to the occasion and come back from any adversity. As a symbol of this spirit of optimism, Mayor Monks announced that the city would build a park out of the ashes. The fire debris was taken to the Globe Pond located on the corner of Globe and South Main Streets, where the first cotton mill was established in 1811, now long gone, and filled in to make a park. And so Father Kelly Park was created and exists today, even though residents are probably quite unaware of the significance of this location and the history that is literally under their feet. Billboards were soon raised that proclaimed the indomitable spirit of Fall River following the Great Fire of 1928. Yes, we had a fire. It was a real one. But we also have a big city with real people in it. We're going to make it bigger and better than ever. Mm -hmm.